Welcome, friends, to episode eight of Point Me to Jesus. I'm your host, Tara McClary Reeves, and y'all, I am with one of my girlfriends today <laughs> who is absolutely, truly a Renaissance woman. I mean, I know you hear about Renaissance men, but Karen Williams is a Renaissance woman. She and I have been friends forever. I mean, Karen, you truly are one of my earliest childhood memories because our parents have kind of grown up knowing each other. So it is just the Lord that has continually put us in each other's paths. And I'm just so grateful for you and your witness. You are a wife. You are an accomplished recording artist. Just because God doesn't part the sea, pull you from the fire doesn't mean You are an author, you are a speaker, you are a rider of Trailways buses across the country. <laughs> you have opened for the likes of Shonda Pierce and getting ready to open for Michael W. Smith and Stephen Curtis Chapman and Mac Powell on the drive-in tour. Can you tell us a little bit about that and welcome? Thank you, and I'm tired just, just hearing that by it. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, that's me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, when you're Pat Williams' daughter, it's like, yeah. you know, that's and the kind apple, of expected of you. The yeah. apple did not fall far from that tree. So I know you just had my dad on a couple of uh, episodes ago, and mm -hmm. it's funny because I look at my life and sometimes I go, man, where did I get all this energy? And then I look at my dad and I go, well, I came by it, honestly. You <laughs> so certainly did. I, uh, I, I have loved the life that the Lord has allowed me to, to create. I grew up in Orlando, Florida. And uh, about 13 years ago now, I packed everything and, and moved to Nashville. I really didn't know what I was doing. I have always had a very childlike faith. And so when the Lord tells me to do something, I might resist for a while, but then eventually I'm going to go, you know what? pretty sure he knows better than I do. So if he's, I mean, he moved the pieces so strongly for me to, to pack up and move to, to Nashville. And so I just threw myself in and eventually signed a record deal and a publishing deal to write music full time. And, and then the doors started opening for me to start touring with, like you said, Shonda Pierce and Michael W. Smith. I mean, my, my heroes in music that I grew up just going, Oh my goodness gracious. I'm now I'm getting, getting to, sing with them and open for them and do shows with them. It's, it's kind of like mind blowing. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, we're getting ready to head out. I love the innovation with these drive-in tours. I know we were all hit blindsided uh, a few months ago with just everything shutting down and what do we do and how do we proceed? And, and, and the music and entertainment industry has been hit really hard, really, really hard. A lot of people are, are struggling. Uh, to figure out how to keep going. And so when they came up with this idea for a drive-in tour, I said, uh, I'm all in. <laughs> Tell me how I can be involved. So we head out uh, next week. Tell us a little bit how it's going to work, Karen, what the plan is. I know Michael W. Smith has done the uh, the Best of Friends, or the is it the Best uh -huh. of Friends tour? Yeah. 35 Years of Friends tour was this the, the was the tour that we were on in the spring. Right. We did exactly one show. <laughs> And then they sent the buses home. I'll tell you just a little sneak peek into what that morning was like. You know, here in Nashville, if you live in Nashville, you'll drive by a Kroger or a, um, you know, maybe a Home Depot or a Target or a Walmart. That's where they call, they make it bus call is, is what it's called. Yeah. And everybody meets there and it's just a safe place for everybody to leave their cars and jump on the buses and go. And then of course, when you get home, your car's there and you head home in a few days or weeks or whatever, however long the tour is. And so that morning back in March, um, a few months ago, I'll never forget it. We pulled in and my husband was waiting there for me to, to pick me up. And he texted me and, see, and he said, there are 15 buses sitting in this parking lot right now. You might see one or two, maybe wow. three. And we pulled in and it was just, it was just bizarre. And so we, we stepped off the bus and there was Mandisa and there was Chris Tomlin yeah. and Toby Mac tour. And there was, and we're all just standing there, you know, that morning. And, and so it, it was just bizarre. But again, like I said, <clears throat> the fact that these promotion companies have been so innovative in figuring out a way to keep touring. So, um, so the drive-in tours are basically exactly what they sound like. You pull your car in. I believe they allow up to six people in a car. 
um, under one ticket or whatever it's you know called and uh, and you pull in you can stay in your car and dial in through the radio or you can bring chairs and sit just right outside of your car or if you have a truck hop up in the tailgate oh. you know it's, it is exactly what it sounds like and so I'm 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 excited it's kind of a new thing for everybody um, but necessity is the mother of innovation so I'm very proud and thankful <laughs> to be involved with people who are very forward thinking and who are going to say, we're not going to let the plans of the enemy stop us. We're going right. to keep out there. We're going to keep sharing hope. We're going to keep sharing Jesus in whatever form that looks like. And so right now it's in the form of a drive-in tour. So, and you know, go. you know, you've been an encouragement to so many, even during quarantine. And actually this, this whole point me to Jesus project was born out of quarantine as well. I think a lot of us who have hearts, for ministry are, are thinking outside the box of ways that we can connect heart to heart and continue to point people to Jesus, even yeah. when speaking engagements live have been canceled. But I loved uh, eavesdropping in on you and Brian White on Wednesday <laughs> nights as y'all would sing together. That was yes. such a blessing. Well, my brain went to the, to the same place that I, you know, like I just said, like, I, I'm like, what can we do? Yeah. There's a lot that we couldn't do and it was easy to fall into that rut and that way of thinking. And I was always taught growing up and I know you were taught the same yeah. thing is, but you can do something. You may not be able to do everything, but there is always another opportunity. It might look different. It might sound different. It might be a little more challenging, yeah. but there is always something we can do. And in this day and age of social media and, and internet, connection and all these zoom things. And, you know, there is, there are still things we can do. And I've always had a passion, um, for worship. Obviously I have a huge passion for wellness. And so a few years ago, the Lord dropped an idea on me for an event called worship and wellness. Oh, and, uh, and, and this year, 2020 was meant to be the year that we were going to kick those off. Yeah. We had done a few smaller events back in January, February, and then of course March hit and it was like, mm, <laughs> what do we do? The world shut down. And so I felt sad about that for a few days, you know, and then finally I said, but we can go online. And so we, we broke up the event. Tuesday nights were, were fitness night. We all jumped in and, and gathered together online and did workouts. Uh, Wednesday nights was our worship Wednesdays and Brian and I sat in the living room and, and just led worship, you know, and cried at times. I mean, it was just very real and raw and honest Loved and the it. Thursday nights were my uh, wellness I jumped back on and did and did some talk about wellness and health and natural health and so we just found a way to make it work uh, and it was really really fun well you've referenced Brian a few times so can you tell our audience uh, who your esteemed husband is well he's kind of amazing uh, Brian White is my husband not the country artist he gets con they get confused a lot uh, he did not sing Rebecca Lynn <laughs> he did not sing with Shania and he writes that's for most of the country artists though correct that's yeah. the other Brian White my Brian White is an amazing songwriter and producer here in Nashville he uh, was an artist himself way back. He was Brian White and Justice was the name of his Christian rock band way, way back. Yeah. And then he sort of fell into songwriting like we all did at some point. And, um, and he has had 15, I believe 16 number one songs now at this point. Um, he wrote a big song for Rodney Atkins called Watching You, which is a big country song. One of a lot my of people favorite call. songs of all time. Yes, I love a lot that of people song. call it the Buckaroo song. Yeah. <laughs> and he's had cuts with Jason Aldean and Rascal Flatts. And I mean, he is absolutely amazing. Yeah. His heart is really in Christian music. And, uh, and he's written for Mandisa and Danny Gokey and Avalon and, and all, I mean, you name it. So when I moved to Nashville, it's, it's an interesting thing because I felt so strongly that the Lord said, if you will go, I have something amazing planned for you. And I always thought that was music related. And it was obviously to, to some extent, but I, looking back now, I realize that Brian was a big part of the blessing that the Lord had waiting for me. And so we were able to uh, we, we met because of writing music, like most, you know, like a lot of people do here in Nashville. And then, but it was about 0.4 seconds before we both went, uh-oh, <laughs> there, there might be more than writing music together here. I mean, lots of, you had lots of high notes for sure. <laughs> well, y'all performed together at the Bluebird and, um, yes. and you've been on the Grand Ole Opry. I mean, how yes. cool is that? Yes, uh, unbelievable. That was and a he, surreal moment. He produced uh, your albums, is that correct? Correct. I have three records now and he yeah. has 
produced all of them. We've written a lot of songs together. It's funny when you are married to a great songwriter and then you go, you know, I'll bring songs home sometimes that I have written with other people. Yeah. Um, and he'll go, wait a minute, babe, this is awesome. You should have written this with me. <laughs> you know, he gets like, wait, you know. <laughs> what, what, do you, what would you say is your most favorite song that y'all have done together? That Brian and I have so many. Yeah, that y'all done. Yeah, oh, that, y'all that is a hard question. Um, you know, it's interesting because, I mean, that's an interesting question because they each have. We know what we were going through. Yeah. When those songs were written, so a lot of times people think that songs are just plucked from the air and yeah. blah, no, 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 no. They are very personal. Um, I heard Laura Story say one time that she said, "I, I think that people assume that." we've like mastered this subject or this thing, this hard thing, and then we write a song about it and we share it with the rest of the world. She said, no, I think that the Lord gives us certain songs because we are the ones that need that message every day. Well, Rest in, rest in the Hope was certainly that testimony for you, wasn't it? Yes. Wasn't it right after your dad's diagnosis with cancer? It was. My dad was diagnosed with cancer 10 years ago. I yeah. cannot believe we are at the 10 year mark because at the very beginning, you know, we had no idea what to expect. We did not know how much longer we had with him. Yeah. So every anniversary of that um, difficult day is a special one. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, that, that song, I wanted to write a song about that experience, but I had no idea how, you know, how do I even begin to take these thoughts and feelings and put them into a song. Well, that's where being married to a brilliant songwriter is a yeah. blessing because yeah. he knew exactly what I was feeling because he saw all the ups and all the downs and all the tears and all the, you know, wrestling with God over it and wanting to punch a wall and then wanting to just get down to Orlando and hug my daddy. And oh, it was just such a difficult thing. And he sat up one night and wrote those lyrics. He wrote almost every single one of the lyrics of Rest in the Hope. Wow. And he showed it to me. And of course I bawled and I was like, mm -hmm, this is pretty much exactly how I feel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then I was getting together a few weeks later with a, uh, another songwriter friend of ours named Trey Heffinger. And we were batting around ideas and nothing was coming. And finally I said, I have this lyric that my husband wrote, you know, you want to put some music to it. And so Trey and I hammered out the melody and that's how that song was written so there's no there's no end all be all to like every song is written the same way the creative process is amazing yeah. and sometimes the lord just drops one on us in the middle of the night or in the middle of doing laundry or you know yeah. whatever yeah. but that was a big one for me because i wrestled with that so strongly mm -hmm. and finally i felt the lord say you have got to rest and trust me that i still have this Yes. You know, and because we, when something difficult hits us, we immediately default to the Lord has forgotten about us. And I can't believe that he would, I mean, this is just like, he clearly does not realize what we're going through. <laughs> That's exactly what we're going through. He has not left us. Right. And sometimes we just need to, to head to the back of the boat and sit in his lap and, and relax, you know, just chill. Like he has got this. But my dad, the, the statement rest in the hope, um, really kind of came from my dad. He said, I, I feel like I am just sitting in my, in, in Jesus's lap right now. And he's just wrapped me in a big hug and, and then I can take a rest, you know, because we, we love to wrestle yeah. and what, what the Lord needs us and wants us to do is trust him and rest because through the difficult things is how he shapes us and how he prunes us. And when we stop looking at our difficult things, our difficult circumstances as the worst thing that's ever happened to us. And instead flip the script in our mind and allow ourselves to say, this is an opportunity. Yeah. What do you have? For me? I'll never forget. My dad said, I've stopped asking why. Yeah. And I've started asking. What. Yeah. I've stopped asking why did this happen? And I've started asking, what can I learn from it? What can I do to help somebody else through it? And I was in Orlando. I was home visiting when he was going through all his treatments and one day, one afternoon, he said, do you want to go with me? I have to head in for a treatment this afternoon. You know, I was kind of like, I'm not sure if I want, I don't know. Do I want to go? Yeah. I said, yeah, I'll go with you. And so I went with him. I walked in and I expected that hospital or what, a, you know, the facility to just be somber and just, yeah. you know, and he, my dad walked in and they were like, Hey, Mr. Williams. And he's like hey, calling every single one of the nurses by name, yeah. high-fiving them. Yeah. You know, I'm like, like a party erupted. Yeah. Did you well, really expect anything differently from your dad? 
Well, exactly. That's exactly. And I realized a new mission field. The Lord had correct. totally expanded his correct. boundaries. Exactly. And that's the lesson in all of it for us. Yeah. Instead of looking at it as the worst thing that ever happened to us. Yes, it's difficult. Yes, that's not what I would have chosen. But there's an opportunity there to meet people you wouldn't have met, to share hope in a different way, and, and to use that testimony to give glory back to God. That's what it's all about. Yeah. That is what it's all about. And, and how that's the Lord why I gifted you with that message and song, because that truly, uh, you know, I, I, I would even text you occasionally when I was riding on the interstate yeah. and how many times 106.9, I'll give a shout out to that wonderful yes. station in North Carolina, loved that, played it constantly, which was fantastic. Yep. So it got wow. a lot of, lot of airplay. I, one of my personal favorites of yours, Karen, is, um, is it There is Freedom? Um, there this is Freedom. Is it there is freedom? This is freedom. This is freedom. Now these shackles that have held me down are unleashed by thorn and crown. Mm -hmm. Your voice on that, I mean, your voice sounds great on all of them, but the message in that song, the video with that song, I just thought that was... Uh, I don't know. I just I love that's that's one that just on my my own playlist I have that in there because it's just it's one of my favorite. I don't even think you ever released that as a single, did you? I never released it as a single. We almost did off that first record, but then Rest in the Hope was the first single, yeah. and you know that was the storyline that was going on more more so in my life at that point. But um, that this is freedom is a song I wrote with Sarah Hart. And Sarah Hart wrote uh, a little song for Amy Grant called Better Than a Hallelujah. So oh, just to give you oh. some reference of who Sarah is. And that's one of those songs that I came home with that night. And Brian heard it and said, babe, you're supposed to save all your great ideas for me. You know, <laughs> that was one that he was like, oh, man. But I'll never forget that. We wrote it. I went into the studio and recorded what we call a work tape, uh, which is just something you record uh, on the day you write the song sometimes. Yeah. And I brought it home that night for Brian. I mean, I played it for Brian and I said, we wrote this song today. It sounds almost hymn-like. I love it. I think that's why I love it so much. Yeah. I said, and I, I, we wrote it for, that was a song I wrote as a songwriter at that point. I wasn't really working on my record at that point yeah. yet. I hadn't signed my record deal yet. And I played it for Brian and I'll never forget. We both just sat there with our eyes closed and I opened my eyes at the end and he had tears just streaming down his face. I, yeah. I'm, I'm like Brian. That's truly, yeah. it, it, it moves me every time I hear it. It yeah. really does. Uh, going back to Brian, you know, I, I am of the age where variety shows were huge on TV when I was growing mm -hmm. up. I still think that you and Brian could easily <laughs> have your own variety show. I, mean, I wish they bring those back, you know, know because his, his, uh, Maynard, uh, just keeps us in stitches all the time. And yeah. I know he is convalescing at home right now because yeah. he had an accident last week. I'm praying that, like you said, that this divine disruption, not only with coronavirus, yeah. but also with his, uh, what is he, bisexual rupture or something. Yeah, exactly. He tore his bicep, uh, and he's calling it his bisexual rupture. That the Lord will allow this divine <laughs> disruption uh, to really inspire more music and more creative um, Maynard moments. Exactly. Well, he is. He is. He is absolutely my, obviously my rock and my amazing husband. But he is a complete goofball, and yeah. so he keeps me in stitches all day, every day. People are like, "Is he really that funny?" And I'm like, "Yes, he's really that." I mean, he. I'm so thankful that yes, life is hard. Stuff hits us like we are not immune to to the tough stuff. But I love that he can find the humor in anything and everything. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so we just we we both are bent that way. We we find the good. We find the humor. We press on even through the tough stuff. And so I'm thankful for such a strong husband. Well, I think probably too, I think this book was written before your marriage to Brian. Uh, the book that you did with your dad, The Takeaway, yes. Uh, yes. which I've bought several copies, but of course, as you know, your dad is one of my mentors and he yes. stocked my library filled I'm with sure. books. So I got the one before it released yes. uh, and I love it. You know, the, the takeaway is so important because I had a Sunday school teacher growing up that I loved so much and he would not let us leave his lesson 
without um, pre-meditating what our takeaway was going to be from that lesson. You know, how, how are you going to apply yeah. what you've learned in scripture today? So tell us a little bit about that book and the importance of doing that project with your dad. It is one of the most special things I've ever gotten to work on. And it was born out of a very organic, very real moment between my dad and I. I was getting ready to move to Nashville years ago. And I wanted to give my dad a present of some sort, you know, like we do. What? And I'm thinking like, what am I going to do? Frame another picture and give it to him? You know, I mean, like, what do I get? I, I knew, I knew that this move to Nashville was going to be a permanent one. You know, he panicking and he's going, you're moving, you're leaving, you're what, blah, blah, blah. this is your home and you're going to just go to Nashville. You don't know anybody there. And, you know, he was panicked. And, uh, but I knew deep down that I wasn't ever going to move back to Orlando. I didn't yeah. say it to him at that point yet, yeah. <laughs> but we had dinner the night before I was going to drive out. Uh, he likes to call it the last supper. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'm going to give him the only thing I can do is just pour my heart out and give him, so I wrote a card that said, dad, it's because of you that I feel prepared to go out on my own. And here's why. And I wrote all of his most important life lessons. You know, my dad as I do. super well, and you know, he's just the ultimate coach. He's the, he speaks in sound bites. You know, he speaks in unbelievable motivational phrases all day, every day. He can't help himself, you know? And so I have had the luxury of being under that teaching my entire life. Yeah. And I, I started thinking about the, his most important life lessons. And I wrote them out in a card. One, two, three, four, five, you know. And I gave it to him that night at dinner. And of course, we both cried our eyes out. But then he stopped and he said, Karen, he held the card up. He said, this is a book. <laughs> a book. You know, he thinks as an author, like we think like as songwriters. Okay. And, uh, and he said, we're going to write this. And I said, uh, okay, you know, I'm all emotional. I'm leaving home. I drove to Nashville. He followed up with it a few weeks later. He said, Karen, we're writing this book write the outline, I will pitch it, boom, like, let's go. And so what was born out of that little card and that little dinner was this book called The Takeaway, 20 Unforgettable Life Lessons Every Father Should Pass On to His Child. Oh, it is. You, up, you actually wrote a song to a company, didn't you? Yes, it's called yeah. I'm Taking You With Me, which yeah. is kind of the, a lot of people call it the daughter's response to butterfly kisses. You know, oh. it's the, I'm Taking You With Me is the daughter saying to her daddy, um, well, gosh, now I'm going to cry, uh, <laughs> but I'm taking you with me. I'm I will always carry everything you have poured into me, uh, my whole life. And thank you for that. Yeah. That was just so beautiful. I mean, it is. Do you keep a journal, Karen? Is that, are you a you journal? Know, I, 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 I do in spurts every once in a while, if something really strikes, I will just write out all my thoughts on whatever that is, but I don't keep a daily journal. I should. Yeah. Um, but my, my records and my, and my books are kind of my, my lifelong journel. Yeah. If that no, that's sense. true. Yeah. My, I can, I can pinpoint exactly where I was, what I was feeling, what was going on with each song and yeah. I could tell you exactly why that song was written, how it was written, um, because that's kind of my, you know, my journal put to music, I guess. It really is. No, that's a very good description. And how many uh, songs have you written? I know your, your dad book wise is on 104 maybe? I think so. Something like that. Yeah. I'm going to have to count those. I know it's, I know it's over a hundred now. And so yes, what it. about you song wise? Oh my goodness. I could not even begin to guess. Hundreds, hundreds yeah. and hundreds. <laughs> yeah, I, I was signed to a publishing deal with Brentwood Benson Music Publishing um, a few years ago. And we would wake up. I mean, my job was to wake up and write songs, not just for myself, for other people all yeah. day, every day. That's what I was paid to do. And give, so us, we, give us a little taste of that experience because I'm, I'm a little familiar with it just because I have friends in the industry. But tell us, uh, you are given a 10 o'clock time you yep. go in tell us a little bit about that process because i know it'd be very interesting to our viewers it is well it is an interesting thing and i had no clue what the songwriting community was all about when yeah. i first moved to nashville i all i knew is that i loved to sing um i fell into songwriting truly by accident so the uh, songwriter's life uh we got to wake up at like the crack of you know 10 i mean it's rough like yeah. that part is rough we got to sleep late <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> 
because y'all stay up until the wee hours of the morning. Musicians are in the studio till late at night and then they sleep till noon. I'm just kidding. Not all of them. That's, that's our, my husband, you know, that's our joke. We got to wake up at the crack of 1030. Yeah, I knew 11 was going to be pushing it for you this morning. So. <laughs> no, we, we do get in the room about 10. You know, if you can, it's great to, to schedule two. Well, every songwriter is different. I learned how to write songs from my brilliant songwriter husband, really and truly. And he yeah. is the hardest working man in this industry. He writes two songs a day, every day, um, wow. unless, unless he has a torn bicep and then he takes a little break, but <laughs> like right now. But, um, but so about 10 to two, um, you know, and then take a, a break, a late lunch break. And then if you can jump back in the room with somebody else or, or another artist or whatever from three till, whatever, six o'clock, seven o'clock, you know, the creative process is an interesting one, obviously. Yeah. So, oh, we, we have to write this song and exactly yeah, it doesn't work quite like that. Yeah. Sometimes you'll get in the room, the room and, and just hammer something out. And, and four hours later, you still have nothing. Yeah. You know, sometimes the Lord is just sort of letting it simmer. And then sometimes like with my song, this is freedom. It's the two hours of conversation that lead up to the song. Yeah. So for example, that day, Sarah Hart and I sat there for hours talking and getting to know each other and telling our stories and our struggles. And then all of a sudden she sat down at the piano and just started playing that opening thing. And I mean, it was, you, you could feel the presence of the Holy spirit. I, I just got oh, chills. I get chills thinking about it. I and mean, all of a sudden we both just sort of started it, it, it was as if the song w was already a song. It's yeah. the, it's the coolest, craziest, most unexplainable thing in yeah. the world. And so she, we just started, started in on this song called This is Freedom, talking about the freedom that we have both found in the Lord. Yeah. And literally in 30 minutes, that song was written. So no two songs are written the same way. Yeah. Um, and it's an exciting adventure. You know, it can be a frustrating adventure at times. The, the creative process is, is just really interesting. But when is you there ever a, a time that the publisher will like give you, okay, this is the subject. Is that sometimes or they'll say, Hey, Carrie Underwood is looking for a song about this, or they'll, they'll have pitch sheets is what they oh. call them. And they'll say, well, so-and-so is looking for this kind of a song or Mandisa needs, you know, she's whatever. Yeah. Um, so you're literally just taking a stab at something for an artist and, um, and you may land on one, you may not, but either way, you're going to write a cool song that day that, and then there's the thing of <clears throat> like, with this is freedom is another perfect example of that. How, um, we wrote it, I, Mandisa was actually looking back then. And so we kind of wrote it thinking maybe this could, maybe she could sing this. I don't know. Uh, and it ended up on my record. So, yeah. you know, you just never know. And then another song, I, I wrote a song years ago, uh, called he's already there with yep. a friend in town called Bernie, uh, named Bernie Nelson is, is my friend who I wrote that with. And we wrote it as kind of a laid back country song. Yeah. Well, a bluegrass group heard it and loved it. And they put a bluegrass thing behind it. So, and I was like, I don't write bluegrass music. What do I, my publisher called and said, congratulations. You, you have the number one bluegrass song in the country right now. I remember I, that. Wait, what? I don't, I don't write bluegrass. And she's like, well, funny story. <laughs> and so she told me, so it's just, it is never dull, you know, it yeah. is um, the, cre it's just, it's an interesting life we live over here, but we love it. Yeah. <laughs> well, <you're laughs> an I mean, you, you're a very talented um, musician as well. I mean, you and Brian both play the guitar. Do you play any other instruments? I play the ukulele. Oh, so wow. I, I fell in love with the uke a few years ago and there's only four strings, so I can handle that. Yeah. Um, and I, it's just, I have determined that it's impossible to play or listen to a ukulele without smiling. Yeah. That's what I've determined. That's true. Uh, and so since part of my goal is to put a smile on people's faces every day, then I'm like, well, the ukulele is a perfect way to do that. So uh, my song, Who Says, was written on the ukulele. Uh, and then I've written some other songs that um, have not been cut yet on the uke. And it's just fun. I mean, you can't, you can't not be happy. <laughs> this drive-in tour, will you be able to do your own set list or will that be something you have to run through uh, the group or, or how does that work? Yeah, part of what part of my uh, job out there on this tour will be uh, to speak and sing for Food for the Hungry, which is an amazing organization that I work with uh, to help children in in some of the most impoverished areas of the world. Yeah. So part of what I incorporate in that is my song "Ordinary Angels." Yeah. 
because I'm so passionate about kids all over the world, clearly, because I'm the big sister in a family of 19 children. Yep. And 14 of my brothers and sisters were adopted from all over the world. So that's a big part of what I will tie into uh, with this tour. And then I get to share my song, Ordinary Angels, which if you haven't heard it yet, go download that and then send it to somebody in your life who's been your ordinary angel because we all, we all have those people. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, and it's really interesting how the Lord has woven, you said at the beginning, all the things that I love to do, uh, author, speaker, singer, you know, all these things. And for a long time, that was like, well, how do I, how do I incorporate all of that together? How do I tie all of that together? And so this opportunity with Food for the Hungry allows me to do that. Um, and it's just really, really amazing how, how the Lord, you know, there were all these arrows flying in the air and then the Lord finally hooked me up with food for the hungry. And it was like bullseye. <laughs> I get to incorporate everything I love to do. You know, with, with the racial unrest in America right now and just, uh, so much division and strife, I think your family is just an incredible role model and testament to the power of the Holy Spirit and the heart of a home. And can you talk a little bit of, about that? I mean, you, you truly just, you know, skimmed the surface, but uh, knowing your family personally, uh, imagining the bathroom situation in your house and uh, the sharing. <laughs> the yes, it was a, a crazy way to grow up for sure. But I, I was four years old when my parents started adopting children. Um, and we adopted two little girls from South Korea. They were, they were two and three and I was four. And so, and I had two older brothers at the time, two biological brothers. So I was thrilled to have some sisters finally. Yeah. Uh, but then the boys overtook us. There are now 11 boys and eight girls. So we're, we're way outnumbered, but yes, growing up, I mean, the bathroom situation, you know, there's no doubt that, um, that, that shaped me into who I am. Yeah. I am. I'm just the big sister. You know, I, I'm the oldest girl in the family. I grew up as the oldest sister. And so I can't help but just sort of, you know, a lot of people say, do you have kids? And I'm like, no, I raised half of my, I raised my younger brothers and sisters. I'm yeah. good. <laughs> I yeah, did. exactly. Um, and but I'm thankful for that. You know, I, I, I couldn't always have said that. There were moments where I was like, Lord, really? I mean, this crazy family, you know, <laughs> Couldn't you have put me in like a normal family with like two kids and a white picket fence of some sort, you know, and something calm and chill. And, and then I grew up and realized there is no such thing as a normal family. No, so that makes me feel better. But, um, but I am so, so thankful for, for my upbringing now. Yeah. You know, there, there reached a point in my adult life where I was like, I am the most blessed girl in the world that the Lord saw fit for me to be the big sister. Yeah. Yes. In this crazy family, but this wonderful, blended, beautiful, like when I look at our family photo at Christmas time, I mean, well, first like of all, the United Nations, it, <laughs> that's what Brian said. The first time I took Brian home for Christmas, he said, you guys look more like a meeting of the United Nations. He's like, what is going on here? And I said, hold on tight. You'll be okay. He yeah. said, y'all put on name tags or something because for Christmas now between spouses and grandchildren or my nieces and nephews, I mean, it's like, it's like 60 some people. Oh, so I'm like, oh, who are, you know, I'm never going to learn all these names. I said, yes, you will. It's, you know, but there's always a moment at Christmas where I look around and go, man, like, this is amazing. Steven, you were born in Korea and David, you were born in the Philippines. Oh. And my sister, Danny, you were born in Brazil and I was born in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> like there's no reason in the world mm. why we should even know each other, let alone be able to, to be the family, the beautiful, amazing family that we are. And that's the beauty of adoption. And that's the beauty of when God calls us to do something. I, I mean, I'm thankful that my parents didn't ignore that tug on their heart because yeah. it's would have been really easy to do. Okay, Lord, no, surely you need somebody else. Mm -mm, yeah. no, that's too hard. It's expensive. We got to sacrifice a lot. Like, no, Lord. Yeah. And I'm so thankful that they said yes. You know, I talked to my dad about that a few years ago. I was like, dad, what were y'all feeling back then? Like, were you, yeah. were you terrified? Cause I know that you, you know, my dad, he's just always positive and all that, you know, but the truth of the matter is it was hard. Yeah. It was really hard. Yeah. Um, and I said, were you, were you terrified back then? Were you, I know you were excited. We all were excited, but like you had to be a little scared to death. 
Yeah. And I'll never forget his response that day. He said, yeah, Karen, I was a little scared to death. And I said, did anybody tell you you were crazy? He's like, oh yeah, <laughs> more than a few times. He said, but he said, I have learned throughout my life that if I'm not just a little bit scared to death, he said, maybe I'm not doing enough. Oh, wow. Wow. And that was one of those lightning bolt statements for me that I, you know, it completely changed my perspective. And so I have given myself permission now to be scared to death when I'm yeah. taking big risks. Yeah. It's okay to feel that, feel that fear and do it anyway. Yeah. You know, um, because our goal is dependence on the Lord. And if we feel like we can do it in our own strength, then we're not relying on his. That leads me into another transition. Who would you say uh, in God's word is your hero of the faith? If you could oh, name, name one. Name one. I have several, but if I had to name one, I would probably say Ruth. Uh -huh. And it's interesting that my stepmom's name is Ruth. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I have always admired uh, Ruth, Ruth in the Bible. I admire yeah. my mom too, but Ruth in the Bible, I admire her loyalty. Um, I admire her willingness to, 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 to take the risk that she did. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a pillow that sits on our bed over there on the other side of our house uh, that says, where you go, I go. And I have always um, just loved that as a, as a woman, you know, we, um, there's so much to, to be learned from Ruth about being a wife and about being loyal and standing, you know, where you go, I go. Yeah. Um, and when my parents got married, my dad and Ruth, I, I'll never forget it. I was 17 years old. It was an exciting day, but it was a difficult day for all of us. Divorce is never easy, but yeah. remarriage, and be beautiful. Um, and I, I remember my dad and Ruth incorporating that verse into their wedding vows. Oh. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I will stay. And your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And then my dad and Ruth added, and your children will be my children. Oh, appropriately so. <laughs> my dad had a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> point. And so that, if I had to pick just one, that would, she, she would probably be my hero. That's beautiful. And I, one of my favorite uh, journeys that I've made with you virtually um, has been your tour of the Holy Lands. Um, oh. Tell us a little bit about that. You were with Governor Huckabee, was it a year yeah. ago or maybe two years ago it now? A year ago, year and a half ago now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. That was an unbelievable experience. They invited us to go and help lead worship over there. And, uh, and then once we got over there, they, they said, would you, would you sing, this is freedom, um, at the garden tomb? And yeah. I, said, uh, I will try, <laughs> I will try to sing it and not cry it. <laughs> but, um, if you've never been to the Holy land, I, I have not, I'm looking forward oh, to going, but you have got to go, but you've got to go with the Huckabees because they do it right. They have been taking these, um, tours for, I don't even know how many years now. Um, but it's kind of what one of our, uh, tour mates that on that trip said, this is kind of like the Rolls Royce of Israel tours. I mean, they, they, the beautiful thing about the way that they do it is that you just take care of everything up front, your travel, like everything is done yeah. for you. I mean, down to like, there, there's water bottles on the buses for you. Like you don't, you, they do it in a way where you literally don't have to think about one thing while you're there. Wow. Focus on why you're there. Bring a journal, bring your Bible. Like they want it to just be a time of refreshment, obviously of just, you know, time with the Holy spirit. But I remember landing and getting on the bus that night and our guide was introducing himself and just kind of getting us started, taking us back to the hotel so that we could head to bed and wake up early the next morning. And he said, tomorrow morning, uh, I, uh, we will be at the temple Mount and he goes, and I'm going to place you on some steps where we know for a fact that Jesus walked oh. and I just sobbed, you know, but so what they do is they call them a sites, B sites and C sites throughout Israel, meaning we, a, an A site is we know for absolute 100% certainty that this is where Jesus was. A B site would be, we're pretty sure a C site would be he's, he was in this area, you know? Um, and so I appreciate that, that it's, yeah. it's very real and honest. Yeah. Um, but goodness. We saw, I mean, so the Huckabees do it to where you start in Jerusalem. A lot of tours will, will go in chronological order. Yeah. The way that they do it is we started in Jerusalem and um, because that's such an emotional, you know, I mean, you're, you're going to the church of the Holy Sepulcher and you are literally, you can walk up these little windy stairs mm -hmm. and you have to take your time, go very slow. Everybody is, and just give the people before you time to, you know, and then you get to have your moment. 
to where you can literally reach your hand down through this little hole cut in, in this, through this plexiglass and you can touch the ground where they believe that the cross of Christ went into the ground. Mm. It was one of the most, I, I don't even have words for yeah. what that moment was. I mean, Brian and I experienced it together and we just, you, you can't, you just can't even speak for a few hours after that. It's mm. unbelievable. Mm. Um, so I highly recommend if you have never been. Well, y'all really, and I, I loved, uh, you, you kind of kept a, a video blog, I guess, because you documented a lot yeah. of the places that you visited. So for those of us who have not been blessed to go, I wish one day that you would put a YouTube channel together. Yes, I need to do that. Well, go, you can go on my Instagram at Karen Williams, but it's Karen with a Y. Okay. And, and I have highlights saved from those oh, videos. Good. Because oh, I'm, I'm so visual and creative minded. I am too. Yeah. Yeah. For me, Instagram stories are kind of like live scrapbooking. That's what it feels like to me. Yeah. And so I did. I, I did all those videos throughout the day and then I saved them to oh, highlight good. where it'll say Israel one, Israel two, Israel. Because it oh, only. Good. I'm glad to know that. I'm, I'm much more on uh, Facebook than I am Instagram. But uh, yeah, okay. I'll definitely do that. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. I should mash it all together and do one big, you know, one big thing. And I, and there's video of me singing "This Is Freedom" live at the at the um, Garden Tomb, which was just I somehow made it through. I was like, Lord, yeah. please help you me. You did to an amazing <laughs> job. It was beautiful. It really was. I mean, it was almost like yeah, this this would be an amazing video itself. You know, yeah. I loved what you yeah. did with yours, but uh, but that would be an amazing one right there. So. Thank you. Well, the video, the the music video from "This Is Freedom" is something that um, Campus Crusade for Christ took film uh, footage from the Jesus film yep. and Magdalena, and they asked me, would it be okay to put this video together? And I said, um, absolutely. <laughs> And I'll never forget. I mean, the, from the first time I saw it until today, every single time I watch that video, I, I, I end up choked up, you know, with tears in my eyes. It is oh, you, I mean, it's, you cannot help but be moved by that. I mean, you really, you really cannot. In closing, Karen, what would you, um, what, what takeaway would you leave with our viewers? Um, whether it be a favorite verse or a quote or um, words of wisdom from, from your dad, <laughs> what would you want us to ponder on um, going into this week? You know, there are so many uh, still at home, not necessarily a mandated quarantine, but uh, moms that have all of a sudden become homeschool moms. And then um, yeah. there's just a lot of, lot of stress and strife and uh, just frustration and anxiety. Yeah. Tell, us, tell us that little bit. And then I'd also like for you to give us ways, and I'll put the link on there, but maybe a few of the tour cities that you're going to be touring with this drive-in oh. tour and how yeah. we can connect with you. Okay. Yeah. All of that is on my website, karenwilliams.com, or just look up the Michael W. Smith, Stephen Curtis Chapman, Mac Powell drive-in tour. Yeah. And uh, I think they're also adding a few cities. So some of it is still a little bit up in the air. We just got word that they added four more shows, which is wonderful. And I don't awesome. know. If yeah, so just kind of keep updated there, or you can go to awakeningevents.com, and that will have all of it there. That's the, the company that is um, putting all of this on. Well, I want our viewers to check out Karen Williams' music. Check out Karen Williams' movie. Go ahead, Karen. I'll tell us about your movie. Well, The Power of the Air is available now, and I played the wife of the main character. You know, the power of the air means power of the airwaves in our lives. It's basically what that means. And and, uh, and it's a movie about how the movie theater has become, how this one man believes that the movie theater has become the most powerful church in America. In other words, that's where we go, the movie theater and, and our, all of the airwaves in our lives, that's where we go for truth. And we have, we have gotten away from going to the Bible for truth. And so it's really a, a convicting message of like, hmm, what am I putting first in my life? Yeah. So that was a real honor to, to play that character and, and to uh, it was strange to feel like I was married to somebody else for a minute there. <laughs> for a few well, days. you're a great actress too. I'm sorry I didn't include that in your bio, but no, you are. <laughs> thank you. I love, I, you know, if you grow up in Orlando and you have any interest in singing and dancing and acting, well, you've got it all at your fingertips there between Disney and Universal. So that's what I grew up doing. And, and I, I just, I love it. I'm very, very thankful that the Lord has allowed me to, to do what I'm passionate about. It's all about it, that's what it's all about. Figure out what you are passionate about 
and go after that. For me, my passions are Jesus, people, and music in that order. Yeah. And, uh, and every day I wake up and go, how, how do I seek him further, deeper, uh, more? How do I impact somebody's life today? You know, Jesus and then people. And then how do I do that through, through music or through speaking or through whatever it is that, yeah. whatever doors he opens. When I moved to Nashville, when I drove up that day, I'll never forget sobbing my eyes out saying, Lord, I will walk through whatever doors you open. Yeah. Even if they're outside of my comfort zone, even if it seems crazy, as long as I know a hundred percent that this is the door you are opening, I promise to walk through it. Yeah. And the doors, and that, that's a big promise to make because he has opened some yeah. Yeah. amazing doors that have, that have scared the lights out of me. But I have kept that promise. I might walk through the door with my knees shaking, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I, I made him that promise and I have held to, to that. And, and he is faithful uh, when we keep walking and when we keep seeking him and keep trusting him no matter what, even in the middle of, of a pandemic, even in the middle of things yeah. not making sense. He is still sovereign and he is still good. And thank you, Karen, for your faithfulness to him. You know, I, I think uh, your trustworthiness is such um, a tremendous honor to and a reflection of your walk with him because uh, you have had tremendous opportunities to compromise. And, and uh, you know, when, especially when you're in the entertainment world and uh, thank you for being a shining light. Um, thank you for determining to finish strong um, because for those of you um, watching, you know, it's, it's a blessing to have uh, a role model that seeks passionately after the Lord Jesus with all of her heart. And that's who we've had with us today. Karen, thank you for sharing your time. You know, I love you. I love you dearly. And you and ditto to everything you just said. I hope you know what uh, an amazing woman you are and what an impact you've made on my life. Well, I love you dearly. Thanks so much. And can't wait to follow the tour and uh, follow Maynard's adventures now that he's homebound. So yes. Yes. thank you for your prayers. We will, we're, we're about to head out on a new adventure with this drive-in tour. So we'll, anyway. we'll be praying and watching and yes. tuning in and prayerfully you'll be close to us because I want to come get you home. So. So. I love you dearly. I love you too, sister. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye-bye.